1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, first 12 verses. I'll read and then I'll ask for God's help. Paul says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we have never come with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. But we did. We proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and our hardship, how working night and day so as to not be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you as a father would his own children so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Well, Father, we want to learn today. We want to come and ask your word to do the work of surgery that it does on the body of Christ. You said it's sharper than any two-edged sword or scalpel and that it opens us up to see ourselves Lord, that you might make corrections, that you might heal us. Lord, would you use it as a mirror today so that we might see the things that need correction. But Lord, encourage us to become more like Jesus. We want to be your body on this earth and glorify you. So help us, help me today to deliver your word the way that you would. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Chapter 1, we've studied. If you weren't here, we missed you. But you can go and listen to it. Chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians is Paul basically saying, I know you're saved. That's verse 4. I know God's choice of you, his election of you. And he talked about the evidence of being true believers. He talked about that work of faith in their lives, that labor of love, and what he called his the steadfastness of hope. Then we studied already in chapter one how he said, I know you began to imitate me and you became an example to other churches. And he talked about their joy that they had, even though they were being afflicted, they're being persecuted, but they had the joy of the Lord. He talked about their conversion, how they had turned from idols to serve the living and the true God. And people around them could tell they were different how the word of God was now sounding forth. Remember, reverberating out all over Macedonia and Achaia. He says, I really don't need to say anything more about sharing your faith because you're doing it so well. And then at the end of the chapter in verse 10, he said, and I know you have your eyes on the skies. You, you're waiting for Christ to come back. And we talked about how these are attributes of, of a believer. Though this is a young church, they're new believers. These should be true of all of us. And how they became an exemplary church to other churches. Now in chapter Two, Paul changes the focus from the evidence in their lives that they're saved, and he starts talking about the character of himself and his ministry team there. You know, uh, as a pastor, um, I have a lot of books on my shelf. I have a whole wall of books. I suppose uh, pastors, 20 years from now, maybe that'll be you know, something in the Smithsonian, but uh, I still got a few. One of the books that I love is a little, it's almost a pamphlet, it's not very big, but it happens to be called Doing Ministry Right. You might have noticed I plagiarized it for my title of my message today. Doing Ministry Right. It's written by a pastor who was then a pastor up at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa who uh, actually Pastor Chuck asked to start the Bible college in Twin Peaks. And uh, 
what he has done is he's written a number of pamphlets and booklets called Doing Ministry Right and also uh, Lessons for an Assistant Pastor, uh, subtitled Things I Learned from My Pastor. And basically what he says is, I want to teach others how to do ministry, and I want to tell you how I've learned to do it by simply watching the Christ-like character of my pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith. And here Paul's manner is going to be described how he ministered as an encouragement to the church that was there, but also to all of us. You know, as you grow in the Lord, your desire should be to make an impact on another generation. Husbands to their wives, parents to their children, all of us to our grandchildren if God gives them to us and to the Christians around us. I just finished a class, some of you in this room took it, um, in our school called Spiritual Development. There in 1 John, Paul says, I have written to three classes of Christians. He says, I've written to you children because you know him who is from the beginning. You see, we all start out in the kingdom of God as babies. Every one of us. You have to be born into the kingdom of God. And there's a baby stage. Some of us in this room, we're baby Christians. Maybe we've been Christians a long time, but we're still very young in the Lord. We haven't grown much. And uh, then Paul, or rather, uh, John says, I've written to you, young men. He says, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. And you grow into that place where you aren't just all about you, like babies just are by nature and just in need of other people to take care of them and feed them. But you start ministering to others, the young men's stage where you can carry the burdens of others. Paul says, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves and have spiritual victory. And then he says, I've written to you fathers. <laughs> because you know him who has been from the beginning. And there's that stage where you grow into your say, I don't want to just be about me. I want to serve, but I also want to parent. I want to minister to others. I want to bring people into the kingdom of God, and I want to help them grow, and I want to be an example to them. And so in our text today, we're going to talk a little bit about Paul's Christ-like manner of ministry, doing ministry right. And I thank God that it's fully reproducible. No copyright on it. Uh, you might say that Paul is writing it down, what he did that was right, so that we could do it right as well. Jot down Philippians 4 and verse 9. Here's what he said to that church. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So let's look at it. Put it down letter A if you're filling in the blank. Share God's message with authority and with purity. Authority and purity. Take a look at the text, beginning in verse 1. He says, You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. You know, he wasn't there very long. He was actually only there three Sabbaths, or we would probably say three Sundays. Can you imagine Sunday when he trying to start a church in just three Sundays? That's all he was there before persecution began and they had to get Paul out of town and with his ministry team. Uh, Pastor Chuck said this about ministry. He said, the glorious thing about serving God is that it is a salaried position, not commission. We are not really paid with or for the results. We are paid for our faithfulness. And if you're not sure of that, just go study the life of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called to a ministry where God said, I want you to deliver my word, and by the way, nobody's going to receive it, but that's your job. Well, thanks, Lord. I'm at least glad that you're okay with it. Um, but here Paul was only there three weeks and he had to get out of town by night because the persecution was so great. And frankly, it reminds me of his beginning experience. I don't know if you remember, but when Paul got saved on the road to Damascus, he was on the way to Damascus to arrest Christians. He was there to neutralize the church, but he met Jesus on the way. And so rather than neutralize anything, he began to evangelize. Everybody was shocked when he got there and he started preaching Christ as the Savior, alive from the dead. He said, I just met him on the road when I was coming here. Well, the Jews didn't like that in Damascus. But Paul thought, spirit Phil, I can preach to the Jewish people. They'll receive the Messiah. Oh, no, they wanted to kill him. They stood by the gate day and night ready to kill him. And the church, the brethren there in Damascus, had to lower him over the wall, remember, in a basket by night. Well, it's very similar to what happens here in Thessalonica. The brethren, too hot to handle, Paul and his ministry team, have to get out of town by night. But even though it seems to be a fail, it wasn't a fail at all. Our coming to you was not in vain. In other words, God has started a work there, and it's powerful. Put this down. Be bold in spite of opposition when you share Christ. Look at verse 2. 
He says, but after we had already suffered and we had been mistreated in Philippi, that was the previous city that he planted a church, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel amid much opposition. So he's reminding them of something they knew, his experience in Philippi. I'm sure he still had the bruises. I'm sure he still had the scars from being beaten there in Acts 16 in Philippi. Remember, he was thrown into prison. It would have been a temptation for anybody. You know, this message is unpopular among the Jewish people. I'll just back off a little bit. Instead, I'll give a message this, this Saturday, you know, this Shabbat, this time up in the pulpit on positive thinking. That should go over well, you know. Or discover the power from within. I'll do a Tony Robbins on the crowd. That certainly will go well. No, we see that he has holy boldness. Jot down Proverbs 28 and verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. The wicked flee when no one is pursuing. <laughs> that was like a little chicken little there, doesn't it? <laughs> it's all in your head. The wicked run when nobody's even chasing them. But on the contrast, the righteous are bold as a lion. You know, we're told that Jesus, when he was before Pontius Pilate, and he came down to it, it this moment in time where he could make a decision how he would answer, because Jesus was accused of calling himself a king and allowing other people to call himself a king. That was, you know, the charge in the in the political, in the pagan world, in the religious world, it was that he was, he was calling himself the Messiah, but they knew that would never mean anything to the Romans. So no, they, when, he, when they charged him before Pilate, it was sedition. It was that he was claiming to be a king instead of Caesar. And so Pilate asks him the question, point blank, are you a king? <laughs> There's this silence, you know, it's like, what are you going to say, Jesus? And he said, you have said it yourself. It's a, an a Hebraism to basically say, absolutely, Abs I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world to proclaim the truth, to testify of the truth. That's when, remember, Pilate gets all philosophical. Well, what is truth and all? But Jesus, the Bible says in Hebrews, he, he confessed the good confession before Pilate. He stood his ground. He didn't back off at all. And Paul was an example of that, even though he knew there was going to be hostility. Nonetheless, he honored the gospel. I don't know how many of you have ever heard the name Peter Cartwright. No, he had nothing to do with Bonanza. He was an actual man. He was a circuit-riding preacher in the 19th century during the time of the Second Great Awakening. By the way, he baptized 12,000 people into the family of God. On one occasion, he was getting ready to preach to a very large congregation, and somebody came to him and said, you need to know that President Andrew Jackson is in the audience. So make sure whatever you say is not offensive to the president. He said, oh, thank you for telling me that. He walked right up to the pulpit and he said, I've been told Andrew Jackson is here today. And I've been asked to carefully guard what I'm going to say. So I want to begin by saying Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he doesn't repent of his sins. You could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> After the service, Jackson walked up to Peter Cartwright and said, if I had a few thousand such independent, fearless officers as you are and a well-drilled army, I could take old England back. By the way, later, Jackson, I don't know if you know this, he gave his life to Christ before he died. And in part, I'm sure it was the impact of the gospel that was shared that day. You say, oh, I wish I was more bold. So often I'm so timid when I have a chance to talk about Jesus or maybe I even come across a little apologetic. If you want more boldness, let me just put it very clearly. Ask for it. Ask for it. You say, what do you mean? That's where it comes from. The power of the Holy Spirit in you. And if you're a Christian, he's already in you. He wants your mouth. He can give you courage that you don't have right now. How do I know that? Because it's biblical. Jot down Acts 4.29. Listen, the background of this story is this. The apostles are preaching Christ, and they get arrested, and they get beaten, and they're told, stop it. The very person that they had killed Jesus, now his followers, their lives are in danger. As they're being arrested, and they're saying, hey, basically, we'll do to you what we did to him and let you stop filling Jerusalem with this man's name, bringing his blood upon us, which <laughs> was on their hands. And after they beat them, and after they sent them out, forbidding them to preach. In Acts 4.29, the Christians come back together and they have a prayer meeting. 
What do we do now? Authorities are telling us not to preach. They had already told them we ought to obey God rather than man. We're going to do what the Lord's told us. Very interesting prayer. We won't study the whole prayer, but they basically quote scripture about the sovereignty of God. It's amazing. God, we know that this is all planned by you. We're okay with it. The only time they even pray about this threat to arrest them again is in verse 29. And here's what it says. Now, Lord, take note of their threats. That's all they say. Now, yeah. Lord, notice their threats. And grant that your bondservants might speak your word with all confidence. Then in verse 31, here's what happens. Next slide, guys. When they had prayed, the place where they had gathered was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the word of God with what? Boldness. You want it? You don't have it? Ask for it. It honors the Lord, and Paul says, we were bold, even though our experience in the previous city wasn't good, even though it might cost us our freedom or our lives. Put this down, number two. We see that Paul's message was, put it down, a pure message. He had a pure motive, so put in the word message and motive, and it was without manipulation. As he describes his ministry, message, motive, and manipulation, you fill that in while I read, beginning in verse 3. He says, for our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. Just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. Because we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. Here's what Paul is saying. We didn't water down the message or, or make it more powerful. We weren't willing to mess with the truth. You know, um, there are those today, probably among the largest churches in the land, who have large churches. They might be good teachers, but they leave certain things out of the message. They don't want to talk about hell. They don't want to talk about sin. They don't want to talk about judgment. They only want to talk about the things that will make people feel good. And while we all want to hear about the love of God, and we need to, we also need to share the whole counsel of God in Scripture. You know, um, these messages that are about how God wants to make you wealthy, or how God wants to make you more successful in your business or in relationships, or just to make you happy. I hate to break it to you if you love hearing that, but the fact is God, his primary goal in your life is not to make you happy. It's to make you holy. But I have good news for you, because holy means set apart for God to become his. And the Bible does say, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. But his primary goal is not just to fulfill your dreams, but for him to fulfill his will in your life. There are all kinds of messages out there that appeal to the fleshly sensitivities of people, the fleshly desires of people. But this is nothing new. The false prophets from the beginning of time have always spoken to kings and the people what they wanted to hear. Because you see, our flesh has one tune that it plays on its jukebox. It's tell me something good, you know, tell me I'm a nice person, tell me God wants to give me a big Christmas for me. That's just the way our flesh works. Interesting, some of the articles out there, I read an article not long ago, it asked the question, is sin genetic? They said, hey, sin is just human nature, right? Well, according to the Associated Press and Discovery.com, two experts on the subject, I guess, Swedish researchers have reportedly found that marital problems and even the tendency to cheat on a spouse or a girlfriend can often be attributed to the male's inherited genes. Your, your sin problems are genetic. Well, you know what? I agree, actually. Yeah, no, actually, I do agree with that. Jot down Romans 5.12. I'll prove it to you. Romans 5, verse 12. It, it actually is genetic. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. It's the genes you and I inherited from Adam. You see, none of us is quite right because all of us are members of the Adams family. That's the problem, you see. But Paul said when we came, we didn't mess with the message to make it more palatable to you. Our message is not by way of 
error. It's kind of an interesting word in Greek, the word error. It's the word planao. We get our word planet from it. You say, what does that have to do with error? Well, you see, the stars had fixed positions in the sky every night, but there were these other lights that would move around. Unlike the stars, they were the planets, planao. And so to, to, to go astray is what it means to wander. He said, our message had no error in it. It was, it was pure, but not only uh, was it pure or was it a, a truthful message, but there was no, he says, impurity. Now, this word can speak of moral impurity. You know, all through the news right now, it's all about politicians and sexual abuse. And it's the big stories on every page. And uh, how sad it is that the men who are leading our nation or wanting to lead our nation uh, have, uh, do not have sexual integrity in their lives. And I don't care what party you have, I think that that should keep you from office, personally. But it's not just in the political realm. It's in the spiritual realm as well. And there are pastors of large churches, and I would love it to say it's not Calvary chapels, but it's not true, who have disqualified themselves because of their moral failings. You know, um, when Nathan came to David, and remember he told him the story about the little ewe lamb and uh, about how there was this man who had taken his neighbor's pet lamb because he didn't want to kill any of his own flock to provide for some guests, but he killed his neighbor's lamb who actually slept in the man's bed and was just a pet because he was so selfish and greedy. And how when David heard about this, it just so offended uh, him that he said, that man should be put to death. And Nathan said, you're the man. That's you. God has given you the entire kingdom, but you go and you want your neighbor's wife, and then you kill her husband. And remember how he confronted him to his face about his sin. And David said, I have sinned. And Nathan said, you won't die, but there will be consequences in your family for the rest of your life. God will forgive you but there will be things that will go on. Here's what else Nathan said. But because of this deed, the sexual sin, and the covering of it, he said, you have given great occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. In other words, you've given the Lord a black eye, David. His reputation is at stake because you're not only the king, but you're a believer in Yahweh. We've got to remember that. that we represent the Lord, all of us, not just politicians certainly don't necessarily but pastors do and so do all of us as Christians and Paul says my message wasn't impure in other words I didn't come there to get something from you I wasn't greedy trying to use you but rather I came to minister to you I think that everybody in the ministry has to ask the question why am I doing this not just what am I doing <laughs> see sometimes I think the Lord comes to us and says what are you doing well I'm serving you Lord Yes, I know, but why? Why are you serving me? Well, thou knowest, Lord. <laughs> yeah, God says, I know. I don't think you know. <laughs> you need to check your own heart sometimes. This is especially true for those that are going into the, uh, on, into the spotlight in any way. You know, I grew up during the Jesus movement in the Lord in the 70s. I was in the tent. I was there with Love Song and and uh, Children of the Day and all those groups. And I watched God's spirit moving, not just here in Southern California, but he was taking and he was raising up these young people who were gifted, gifted singers, gifted musicians, gifted speakers. And they would go out without pay. Just whatever the money they could get for gas, they would get into their cars and they would travel wherever God would open a door. They didn't care about being, getting money. They had no agents signing them. Well, if you'll pay us a certain amount of money, we'll come minister. There was no Christian music industry they were just serving the Lord, and God blessed it. And every Saturday night, I was there, and I'd watch hundreds of young people get saved as the ministry of the gospel would come through music, and then it would be preached, and people would get up, and 100, 200 people would get saved every single Saturday. And I watched it year after year after year as God blessed that. But I also watched when that got shut down. And I remember the night. And I know why it got shut down. Because there was a changing in the culture among those musicians that started to be about themselves. It wasn't about the ministry. It was about who was there and how big our name is and where will this get us and how much money are you paying us. And everything at that point got shut down as far as that ministry. Be careful. Here's what Jesus said. Freely you've received, freely give. 
Paul says, we didn't come with any desire to get money. We didn't come to shear the sheep. We didn't come to some, some benefit for ourselves. Our motive was never greed. Our motive was the glory of God. Anybody in ministry should ask the question, am I in ministry to become known or to make him known, to, to build your own kingdom or to invite people into his? Paul says, and not only that, there was no guile, um, no deception in our methods. We, we didn't pull any punches. We, we just spoke the truth. I refuse to mess with the message, not only because of the audience, but because of the reception. Jot down 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2. Here's what Paul says there. Therefore, since we have received this ministry, as we received mercy, we don't lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So put this down now, letter B. We need to learn to serve God's people with affectionate parenting. But in other words, affection and prayer. First of all, authority and purity in the message. But now he's talking about the messenger himself. Affectionate parenting. Very interesting, the words that he uses. Beginning in verse 7. He says, but we proved. See, he's not talking about the message. Now he's talking about himself. We proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother. As she tenderly cares for her own children. And having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel, but even our own, literally our souls, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and our hardship, how working night and day so as to not be a burden to any of you, we proclaim the gospel of God. Very interesting. Paul wasn't there even a whole month, but he doesn't describe himself as a missionary. He describes himself as a mother. In other words, we shared the gospel, but in terms of ministering to you after you received it, the way a mother takes care of a baby is the way we treated you. Put this down, as a mother sacrificially gives herself for her children. When a baby is born, it must be kept safe. We know that. It must be loved. Many of you know this, that love, affection, is required physically for a baby to survive. Did you know that? A baby that's not held and not cared for physically, not hugged, not you know, loved that way, will actually die. It'll develop a condition, uh, used to be called marasmus. Uh, we use the term failure to thrive now. But where it will become apathetic, lethargic, will not eat, will actually die if it's not cared for. In fact, there are babies in the hospital, as we speak, who have been neglected, who the doctor will prescribe nurses to come in every hour and literally just hold the baby so it can survive. Yeah, physical babies need to be kept safe. They need to be loved. They need to be fed. We all know that. That's 1 Peter 2, too. And they need to be changed quite often. Spiritual babies are no different. Just as a baby needs to be kept safe, so a spiritual baby needs to know that it is saved. A spiritual baby, just come to the Lord, needs to know they're loved. They need to know the love of God is toward them. They, they too need to be fed. They need to be protected. They also need changing. I, I heard of a church that in their nursery had a big sign. It was right from scripture. It says, they shall not all sleep, but they shall all be changed. Well, okay. Paul says, but we didn't just give you the gospel, we gave you ourselves, just like a mother. You see, a mother would take and eat, digest the food, and then turn it into milk and give it from her own life to nourish that baby. And so it's true in the ministry. If you're going to minister to somebody else, you have to ingest the word of God, digest it into your own life that you might impart it to somebody else. It's going to take you giving your own heart. There was a man in the 1800s who went into the mission field, a very dangerous area in New Guinea, along the Fly River. His name was James Chalmers. And James Chalmers was there for some years trying to reach these really savage uh, people that were there. First missionary, uh, pioneer mission work. Uh, on one occasion, he finally went ashore to another uh, village, and uh, he was murdered. He and the other missionary were eaten. And uh, you can imagine the shock wave that came through the Christian world as a result. But there was a man who decided, 
I'm going. I'm going to take up the work that James Chalmers had tried to begin. He was there for several years, and he came back, and his friend said, what did you find when you arrived? He said, I found something that looked more hopeless uh, than I thought, uh, than if I had been sent into the jungle with a lot of tigers. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, those people were so degraded that they seemed utterly devoid of any moral sense. They were worse than beasts. If a mother was caring for a little child and the baby began to cry, she'd just throw it in the ditch and let it die. If a man, uh, his father broke his leg, he would just leave his father on the roadside to die. They had zero compassion whatsoever. They didn't even know what that word meant. He said, well, well what did you do for people like that? He said, did, did you preach the gospel to them? He said, preach? He said, no, I lived. He said, lived? How did you live? He said, when I saw an abandoned baby crying, I comforted it. When I saw a man with a broken leg, I mended it. When I saw people in distress, I took them in and had compassion on them. I took care of them. I lived that way until the people began to come to me and say, why are you doing this? What does this mean? Then I had my chance and I preached the gospel. He said, did you succeed? He said, well, when I left, I left a church. <laughs> I left a church. Paul was only there three weeks. <laughs> but when he left, he left a church. Yes, people can't get saved just if we're nice to them, if we care about them. They've got to hear the gospel. How shall they believe if they don't hear the gospel, Paul says? Absolutely need the gospel. But if we're going to grow each other spiritually, it's going to take more than just our words. It's going to take our love for them and our care for them. Paul says, I treated you the way a mother does. And look at verse 9. It wasn't easy. He says, For you recall, brethren, our labor and our hardship, how working night and day, so as to not be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. In other words, I wasn't a nanny. I wasn't a paid babysitter. I was like a mother. There's an old saying, a man's work is from sun to sun, but a mother's work is never done. Paul says, I was just working night and day. It wasn't about getting anything from you. I think it's good for pastors to have had some experience with working. I really do. I, when this church started, of course, we were small. I couldn't afford to pay anybody for anything. So we met in my home, so we had no rent. I, I had a job. I was a police officer, so we didn't need to pay me. It was great. It was great until the church grew. And for three and a half years, I was a police officer, but I was working night and day. Literally, I, I, the church, as it was growing, I started putting in about 40 plus hours preparing and ministering to this small church. But I was also working 40 plus hours as a cop. I was working graveyard for a while. That was a real hoot. As a, I was falling asleep during my own messages. That's a bad one. Huh? But Paul says like a mother, you know, mom's, mom's put in a lot of hours. And I'll clock out at five o'clock. Sorry, kids. <laughs> Daddy's home. Call him in the middle of the night. I heard of this one husband. He came home from work, and his wife was, uh, well, first of all, as he was walking in from, from where he parked his car on the driveway, there were just toys everywhere. He could barely get into the house, bicycles and roller skates. And He got in, and there were more toys inside, and there was junk on the floor and food wrappers, and he had never seen his house like this. His wife was on the couch in her robe watching TV. Kids were doing something somewhere. He didn't even know the dishes were piled up. He said, well, what happened here? She said, what do you mean? He said, well, I don't understand. The house is a crazy mess. Never seen it like this before. She said, oh. She said, you know how every day when you come home, you always ask me, what did you do today, honey? He said, yeah. She said, today I didn't do it. Paul says, I was like that. I was all over it. I was, it wasn't about anything you were giving me. It was my love for you that was willing to go way up and above and beyond what pay would give. I loved you. Put this down. Number two, as a father purposely lives before his children. Paul says, first of all, I was like a mother with a baby. But then in verse 10, notice, he says, You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behaved toward you who believe. He uses three words here. Devoutly relates to my relationship with God because I love the Lord. So he says, you know how we were as far as our love for the Lord in front of you, but also then he uses the word righteous, which describes the way he lived for the Lord 
in front of them. And then he talks about being blameless. Now, the word blameless is an important word in the New Testament with regard to the character of somebody in ministry. It basically means you are never caught with your hand in the cookie jar because your hand is never in the cookie jar. That's what it means. Not because you're so slick you get away with it. Both deacons, deaconesses, elders, all of them, blameless, it's required. It's required for you to be in the ministry. You need to be blameless. Somebody once walked in to Charles Haddon Spurgeon, actually several men, and they threatened to publish in the newspapers damaging information about his reputation unless he was willing to comply with what they wanted. They were blackmailing him. You know what he said? Write whatever you want across the skies. I've got zero to fear. Go ahead. They had nothing. That's the kind of man that Paul says he was. They had nothing. There was nothing hidden that you guys know about or anybody else. But Paul doesn't just say, you know what we said. He says, you know how we were. In that short amount of time, you got to see our character. You know, there was a guy who started reading the New Testament. He had never read it before. And like I mentioned to a brand new Christian the other day, he said, where should I start? I said, you might want to start with the Gospels. You might want to start about reading about the life and ministry of Jesus, if this is a brand new book to you. And this guy was a new Christian, so he started reading, and he noticed each of the Gospels began in his Bible with these words, the Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to Mark, the Gospel according to Luke, etc. And he wrote a poem that I like, he says to us as believers, you're writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the things that you do and the things that you say. Men read what you write, whether faithful or true. So tell me, what is the gospel according to you? See, your life is the most Bible that some people will ever read. Did you know that? They're never going to pick up this book but they're going to look at the way you treated them as a customer, perhaps, or as an employer. They're going to see as a neighbor. They're looking at you. Paul says, you remember the way that we were with you. There in verse 10. You're witnesses, so is God. Then in verse 11, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. Now, the word encouragement means to come alongside to help somebody say you're going in the right direction, keep going. But this next word in our text where he says not only were we encouraging you, but he says, or he says first exhorting, then he says encouraging. The word encouraging as translated here in the King James says comforting. Perhaps comforting is a good translation, but to be honest with you, I think the word better would be translated persuading you. Like a father who persuades his children, encourages, but they matter how they live. As I've often said, you know, my job is not to fix everybody else's children. You know, when, even in the church, when people have brought me their children, you know I've said to them, take them home, and this is your job. God did not assign your children to me. I can't raise your children for you. That's your calling. God has not given me the patience to raise your kid. He's given you that, right? No temptation, no trial has overtaken you, but to God will give you the ability. I, I mean that with all my heart. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm trying to be honest. It's enough for me to have patience to raise my children. I have to trust God with that. I certainly don't have the ability to raise my neighbor's kids. So I don't even try. You know, There are times I'd like to help. But, um, but this word persuading is more about that. Paul will often say, I beseech you, I beseech you. Please be reconciled. I, he, he begs Believers, as a father would, you know, uh, J. Vernon McGee on this particular verse said, there's a lot of sissy preaching today. He said, where preachers preach little sermonettes that are given by preacherettes that create Christianettes uh, <laughs> with little or no urgency at all. The, the final word that Paul uses, imploring, means literally to bear witness, to testify, to declare, to charge somebody. And he's saying, I do that as a father. In other words, I care so deeply, I call you to better living. So a father will encourage and challenge and charge his children to go from being a baby to becoming a walker. You know, um, we have a, an eight-month-old 
my grandson Jeffrey, who I often talk about just because I like to talk about him. Um, but he's in that, you know, those stages of growth that I love watching. It's like we, we celebrate every little thing that happens in a baby's life. You know, like he's learned, he's learned to crawl in the last few weeks. And I mean, it's, it's so funny to watch. You know, he'll get his, these two arms and one leg are ready to crawl, but he can't figure out why that other leg is in the way. And he's trying to get over the speed bump of himself. But he's finally mastered that. But now, you know, he'll come over to an object and he'll want to climb up. And he'll use all the little time to get up there. And the other day he got up and was like, woohoo! We're all celebrating, putting it on Facebook like anybody else cares about my grandson. But I do. I'm celebrating. Why? Well, I'm not his dad, but I'm his grandpa. And I care about his progress. And we, we, we encourage, we call our children, move on. Go from being a baby to becoming a walker. That's exactly what Paul says. Look at verse 12. So that you would actually walk in a manner worthy of the calling of God's kingdom and God's glory. There are 10 verses in this text that describe the qualities of a godly minister. Certainly, there are some bad eggs in the ministry carton. <laughs> Those who are seeking power or popularity or see God's people as a way to get rather than give. But let me just briefly go through them. In verse 3, it's somebody who speaks the truth. In verse 4, somebody who's seeking to please God. In verse 5, somebody who refuses to flatter other people and they're not greedy. In verse 6, someone who's not seeking the praise of men. In verse 7, someone who's gentle like a mother who cares for her own babies and is sacrificial. In verse 8, Someone who loves the saints and is willing to share their own life as well as the gospel. In verse 9, somebody who's working hard not to be a burden on the person, on the people they're ministering to. Verse 10, someone who's living purely, honestly, and a blameless life. In verse 11, someone who's treating God's people as a good father would his own children. And in verse 12, they're pleading, encouraging, and urging others to live worthy of their calling. You know, um, Queen Victoria of England, when she was a little girl... Um, she had tutors. She had no idea, by the way, that she was in line to be the queen. Can you imagine that? No one had told her. They kept that from her on purpose. And uh, when her tutors were trying to get her to study hard, she had no interest in doing so. And so one of them just decided, I'm just going to tell her. And so one day she said, uh, Victoria, we want you to know something. They actually brought up the, the lineage books and the book, uh, and they said, you are in line to be the next queen of England. Now, do you understand? We think of England as this little island over there. Uh, we're talking 1800s. Um, the British Empire is the largest empire that has ever been on planet Earth. Did you know that? A quarter of the Earth's population. There's an old, there was an old saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire. She would be not only the queen of England, the queen of Ireland, but the entire empire Empress of India as well was added to her title. Uh, she would reign for 64 years. Second uh, longest monarch of the entire British Empire. But she was just a child. So they told her in hopes to motivate her, <laughs> you're in line to be the queen. I'm sure it shocked her. And then she said these words, then I'll be good then I'll be good. And from that day, she changed her attitude about her studies. She applied herself to her studies. And I think of Paul telling Christians, I want you to walk. You see, it's been said, a, a child of a king will want to display the manners of the court. <laughs> Paul says, do you have any idea? You have been called to God's kingdom. What's that? That's talking about the millennial thousand-year reign of Christ. And to his glory, that's eternity afterwards. Do you have any clue? You're not just called to be in the kingdom. Read Revelation 1. If you're a Christian, you've been called a king and a priest. We're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Do we have any clue our, what God has chosen our destiny to be? And Paul says, like a father, I was revealing to you. I was telling you, do you know where you're heading? You need to walk. See, there are many of us in this room who are believers. We've been born again. We've come to faith in Christ. And our life has been changed. But all through the New Testament, Paul is saying, well, now walk worthy. Walk as a child of God. What does that mean? Imitate him. What does it say in Ephesians? As beloved children, imitate your father. He's forgiving, be forgiving. He's holy, be holy. 
We need to actually live it out. And so Paul, as this father, was encouraging this church. And I think what a beautiful picture it is that Paul is able to say, I want you to remember not only how you changed, but remember how we treated you. You know, it's a hard thing to put yourself in front of somebody and say, be like me. I mean, most would say, no, be like somebody else, you know, because <laughs> we see our own faults. Being a model Christian does not mean being a perfect Christian. It means being mature enough that you can share those things that God has taught you, the lessons that you've learned the hard way and even through your failings. But Paul is writing down how he treated them there in Thessalonica during those three weeks and saying, you know what, this is the example that God has given to you to follow. And my prayer is that as a church, and I believe this is true for us, to be very honest with you, as I look out at many of the people that God has called to this church, I see a lot of maturity. And I believe the Lord wants you not only to continue to walk, if you feel like, Bob, I'm not a mature Christian, I'm a struggling Christian, then get involved in Man Up, guys. Get involved in home Bible studies. Get involved in agape groups. You want to grow? Get into the Word more. We'll help you. But you've got to choose to take advantage of what God's put before you. But for those of you that have been walking with the Lord for a while, my question is, are you ministering to others? Are you serving them? You see, I think Christians go through a stage. First they get saved and they're excited about that. And a lot of Christians then start to stagnate. And some of you in this room, it's true for you. You get into what you've been looking for. You hope we are a good church. A church that teaches the Bible. Check. A church that worships God. Check. A church that cares about the youth. Check. And you've got all these things and we fit that bill. But what about you? What about you personally? You say, I'm, it's great for my wife or it's great for my kids. But what about you? Are you still growing in the Lord? Are you still moving on? You know, I have often share with our people that come to the newcomers, but I'll share it here. If you've never heard me say it, our goals are written on the walls. <laughs> Do you know underneath your feet are scripture? Some of you are here. We wrote down verses down here. We stand on the word of God, literally, in this church. But there are four principles for which we stand as a church. One, we want everybody who comes, whether it's one week or for the rest of your life, to know the Lord. If you don't know Christ and you're just coming to church, there's so much more that God wants for you, and it hasn't even begun until you meet Christ, until you bow the knee and say, Jesus died for me. I want him to be my Lord and Savior. And I beseech you like a father would his children, be reconciled to God, come to know him by faith. But if you have, and most of you, many of you have, come to know the Lord. Grow. Grow in the Lord. You say, how do I do that? It has, it's going to be having to do with your relationship to this book, the Word of God. How do I know that? Because Peter said, long for the pure milk of the Word that by it you may grow with respect to salvation. You've got to be in the Word of God. You need to talk to God. That's prayer. You need to let God talk to you. That's the Word. You need to be in a family, just like God delivers babies into a family. Otherwise, they would die. God has delivered you into the family of God. That's Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12. You're part of the body of Christ. You need to get connected and discover your gifts and use them and exercise them. You need to know the Lord. You need to grow in the Lord. It won't happen by just walking in and sitting in church. You'll enjoy it, I hope. But you won't grow and you'll wonder why. Unless you get to know the people around you in this room and in this church. Thirdly, you need to serve the Lord. Every one of us who are Christians was given a gift. You say, well, I don't have one. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Okay, well, the Bible says you do. Where does it say that? 1 Peter 4.10. As each of you has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If you're a Christian, you're gifted. You say, well, I don't know what my gift is. Right. Get on the adventure of discovery. How do I find it? Do I take one of those gift surveys and it says at the end, you're an evangelist. I'll start right now with Billy Graham. No. No. How do you discover your gifts? Listen to me. You serve where there's an opportunity. Read the book of Acts. How did Philip ever start doing miracles and preaching the gospel? He served tables. That's how. You just start by serving where there's a need, and God will grow your capacity to serve the Lord in new ways. Serve where there's a need. Discover your gifts along the way. You say, I already know my gifts. Praise God. Then dedicate them to the Lord and say, Lord, would you use me? So you got to know the Lord. That's where it starts. you got to grow in that knowledge. Paul said that was the desire of his life, to know him more. We never know him completely until we're dead. You say, what? Remember? 
We'll see him face to face. Now we know in part, but then we shall know fully, just as we also have been fully known. Right? There's going to come a day when we'll fully know, but it's not on this earth. So this whole life is about getting to know him better. That's why to the child, John says, I've written to you children, because you know him who has been from the beginning. But what does he say to the fathers, the most mature? Because you know him who has been from the beginning. You're still getting to know him. So you know the Lord, you grow in the Lord, you serve the Lord, and finally, you share the Lord. You say, Bob, this is that area. I just, I don't feel comfortable about that. I don't care. I, I don't feel comfortable in my flesh. I won't ever witness to a soul. But the good news is, the Spirit of God has come to live inside of you, and when he takes charge of your life, when he comes upon you, here's the promise of God. When he comes upon you, you shall be my what? You'll be my witnesses. He didn't say, now go witness. I'm going to teach you the Romans road. I'm going to give you a few chick tracks and uh, the four spiritual laws. Now go witness through the neighborhood. Knock on doors. He never said that. He just said, let the Spirit of God come upon you, and guess what? It's going to happen. So what we need is the filling of the Holy Spirit the control of the Spirit of God, because when He is filling your life, I guarantee you, you'll be a witness for Jesus Christ. You say, how do I get that? You ask for it. For them, He said, wait for it, wait for it in Jerusalem. He didn't tell you to wait. He said, be being filled. Did you ask to be filled with the Spirit of God this morning? Did you say, not to, by the way, it's not just saying the words. Now, let me just say this before I close. Sometimes people think beginning, getting saved is like saying magical words. Did you say the sinner's prayer? Hey, that, is not, that saves nobody. Saying the sinner's prayer doesn't save anybody any more than being baptized. Well, I asked to be filled with the Spirit, and I didn't feel any Holy Ghost goosebumps, so I'm not sure if I was. If somebody walked forward in a wedding ceremony and said words but made no commitment of their heart, are they married? Well, legally, but not probably going to last too long. Listen. The words are just vehicles to express faith. But there has to be faith. If you want the Spirit of God to take over your life, you must yield your life. You don't have to say any words. Just let Him have your life, you see. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit, to allow God's Spirit to start to lead, God's Spirit to be in charge. It's not about some magical words or magical ceremony. It's about a life that's fully yielded to God. And every person in this room, if you're a Christian, I pray you want that. I pray you're asking for it. But more than any of that, I pray you're doing it. God wants to take us as a church places we've never been. I believe God has great things in store for Calvary Chapel East End. I really do. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because we're the bride of Christ. And he loves us to death, literally. And he's coming back to pick us up soon. So I say, until that moment, let's go for it with all that we are. Let's pray.